In this session, we're going to look at a particular educational technology that is commonly used in teaching and learning. And this is the use of educational computer games. Now, in order to fully understand educational computer games, we need to understand the fundamentals that drive the processes using educational games. And that is around play and gamification. Now, play has existed since we have. Um, animals use play, and it's an essential part of the learning process for many aspects of learning, certainly before formalized learning was established. Now, one aspect of play that we need to understand is that it has existed before we had um, formalized teaching and learning processes. Play was a fundamental process that we used in order to engage with learning. And there are a range of examples in animals where they have they utilize play as a process of learning. All animals, even the giants, start off small. But the childhood experience varies hugely. A shrew sprints to adulthood in a month, while an elephant is in for a 10-year marathon. For a chimpanzee, growing up is also a long and sociable business. As well as food and transport, mother provides another service, just as crucial to her young survival. Ape school is one-on-one -on -one tuition, and the pupils watch closely as mother applies her skills to cracking a difficult problem. But it's not all work. Chimps, like many other animals, take time out to have fun. Though dozens of explanations have been suggested, play remains one of nature's mysteries. The rules, though, are simple enough. First, signal your friendly intentions. Rule number two is go gentle. Don't follow through with the bite and let go if it hurts. And finally, it's not about winning. It's joining in that counts. If there's a serious purpose to play, perhaps it's preparation for future trials of strength. Predators like lions purposefully hone their skills of stalking, chasing, and tripping. The cub's game is a mirror of the hunting adult. For intelligent social animals like monkeys and apes, play could be a way of learning how to fit into a group. Japanese macaques rub shoulders with the same gang for up to 30 years. But the truth is, no one really knows what, if anything, play is for. So as can be seen from that clip, there are various uses we have for play in our social interactions. Now, the first is attunement, where we establish relationships with others. Um, now, newborns and mothers is a significant aspect of that. But it's also a way of exploring our own bodies. Um, can be used in terms of exploring objects as a social process as an imaginative, fantasy-based process, as a storytelling or narrative process, and as a transformative process, whereby we're trying to go beyond our existing state of understanding or being 
to a higher state. Um, this might happen through music, dance, various other processes that we can utilize. Now in Teams, I'd like you to try to give some examples of these various forms of play from your own experiences. Now, play is distinguished from other forms of human endeavor. Types of play. What do we mean by types of play? Over the years, by researching children's play, we have come to categorize the behaviors that children interact with called play. There are many play types, and this video is going to give a clear demonstration of each one. So there are a wide range of types of play, and I'll let you explore the video in more detail. But they're being categorized in various forms so that we can better understand the nature of play. Um, there are some contradictions between these various categorizations, and they have developed over the years as we've come to appreciate the importance of play and its place that it can have in the learning processes. So Generally, play is seen as something distinct from work, where we engage in playful activity and we engage in purposeful work-based activity, although there are blends between the two. So, Callios refined six core characteristics of play, that it isn't forced upon us, it isn't obligatory, we're choosing to play. It is different from our root, general routine. It's something special, something that's different. There's also the fact that play involves, um, it's not something that's set in place. You don't know exactly what's going to happen in play. You're involved in some sort of process whereby things can happen differently. And it's not generally a productive process. It's not something that we're doing as work. But there are rules, and while these may be different rules to how we operate in society and in other forms, there are still some established boundaries within what's acceptable and not acceptable in play. And it can very often involve make-believe, where we suspend our disbelief in certain situations to accept that things that aren't real do have a reality. This plays a significant aspect when we start looking at computer-based games. So there are general forms of play. Um, Argon or is comp competitive play, and we see that mostly in, in sporting events, uh, but it can also include things like chess and um, other sort of competitive aspects. And most animal play is very much based around this because it's survival-based learning. 
We also then have alia or chance-based play, where the outcome isn't necessarily determined by our skill or our effort or our age or training and patience, but there's a degree of luck involved. And a lot of gambling-based play is associated with this. There's mimicry or role-playing based play, where we enter into illusions and pretense, and we undertake being coming fictional characters or um, things of that nature. Now, the very earliest forms, this is playing cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians and things of that nature, but there are more complex ways of engaging in this form of play, including role play, um, live action play, um, things of that nature. And then there's what's called Linux or Whirlpool play or Vertigo play. And this is where we're attempting to be caught up in the play process. Um, and this like role, being involved in a, on a roller coaster or with hallucinogens or um, certain types of dance that just we become immersed in the experience. Oops. So these types of play can also be combined in various formats. Poker is both um, alia in terms of, um, of randomness, but also argon in terms of their strategic decisions being made around how to best strategize in playing the game. Um, and so forth. there's various combinations of these types of play that form new forms of play. Now there's two general continuums of play. At one end there is ludus or structured activities with explicit rules and at the other end there is paedia or un totally unstructured and spontaneous activities typified by what's called playfulness. So again, can you think of any examples of play from your own experiences and how might they relate to ludus or structured play or paedia or unstructured play? And if you could post a response of that into Teams. So further categorizations of play have developed. Now we have this set, which is um, mind or subjective play, which occurs within our own uh, mental processes. There's solitary play involving hobbies and collections and things of that nature. Playful behaviors, such as playing tricks on someone. Um, playing fair by a set of rules. Informal social play, such as jokes and having parties and dancing and going to the mall or babysitting. These are sort of socialized play that helps improve our social interactions. There's audience play or vicarious audience play where we're watching others, um, typified in television and films, but also cartoons and spectator sports and theater. There's performance play where we're undertaking some form of performance with music or um, physical fitness activities, um, racing, game, uh, um, gambling with racing horses and so forth, where the horses are undertaking the performance um, and so forth. There's also celebratory play, such as we have around birthdays and various carnivals and events. Contest-based play, so typified in sports and games and risky or deep, deep play, where we're challenging ourselves, undertaking risks. So again, you may have some examples of different types of play from those categories that you've been involved in. And if you could list three of those um, into your teams um, from your own experiences during the past week, what forms of play have you engaged with? You would have engaged with at least some of those forms. So. Identify three of those and share them. Then we have what's called the rhetorics of play. So another way of explaining and exploring um, the different types of play that were established by Sutton and Smith. So this is, involves play as fate, where we're, where we're fated to have something happen to us. It's preordained. And also rhetorics of play as power, where the nature of competitiveness and power relationships dominate the playful processes. So these forms help us examine other aspects of play, such as play being an expression of our identity, who we are, 
being expressed through play, how we are in terms of fairness towards others, how we are in terms of being cooperative or competitive or self-centered. There's various aspects of identity that can be explored through rhetorics of play. There's rhetorics of play as the imaginary and how well we are at being creative and flexible in our perceptions of the world. There's also rhetorics of play of the self, how much we think about our own internal processes, how we understand, is play a form of escapism for us and fun? Is it a form of testing ourselves against others or against ourselves? How we actually examine ourselves through play is another rhetoric. And then there's also rhetoric of play as being frivolous. It's activity that is simply for the enjoyment of the process, even somewhat regarding the consequences, as we can see with tricksters and the fool in historical um, settings. So again, what are some rhetorics of play that you can relate to and have experienced? And if you could post something that one of the rhetorics of play that you may have explored or experienced today. Okay, as we again examine further detail about the concepts of play, there are various principles related to play. Now these have been identified by Guy. I'll let you watch the video yourself. But there's a range of different aspects of play that we can describe as being principles to consider. Now there's 36 of these, so I'm not going to go through them all in detail. But for you to examine a deeper understanding of what is meant by play. So the first is that play can be part of being involved as an active critical learning process. Um, the way that we set up situations can be active and not passive. And this includes also learning. Um, there's aspects of design to play, but also aspects of design to learning and how we, do, how we learn with play. Um, there's meta-level aspects where we think about relationships between other elements at a higher level. Um, and a range of other principles that are associated with identity formation, um, self-understanding, the concept of achievement and what we value and what others value and how those relationships relate to each other has a significant aspect, particularly in competitive play but also in other aspects of play. And this flows through then also into learning. Some students want to learn because they want to compete with others in the learning process. Others aren't at all focused around that. And it may be very much about self-improvement, um, completely divorced of any understanding of thoughts around how others might be impacted by that process. Others are very involved in practice and the idea of continuous improvement. Other students may simply see learning as a one-off instance without the need or desire to um, refine and improve upon that practice. Now this plays a, a big factor into many computer games and how they've been developed. Most computer games assume students will fail and they require a, a series of failures until they achieve success and they are built around that process. Now that's a very foreign learning process for most students, particularly in formal education, where, where we see failure as a negative. In computer games, failure is a necessary positive. It means we have learnt something, or we have learnt some element to then help us overachieve the next barrier that we come across. And that relates to the ongoing learning principle and the regime of competence, whereby we operate in the understanding that everything is doable. It's challenging, but we are going to learn from aspects of the game. It may be involved in finding elements that are needed to overcome the challenges. It may be in developing the skills needed in overcoming the challenges. It may be simply just learning the processes. Eventually we come across the combination that will allow us to overcome the challenge. And that's a fundamental principle of most computer games. 
and so forth. A whole range of various principles that relate to our understanding of games and our understanding of learning as fundamentally intertwined and how computer games can allow us to explore these in much more detail than most aspects of education and certainly most educational technologies. Computer games by their particular genre and focus allow us to engage with learning in a way that harkens back to many of the aspects of the earliest forms of learning around animalistic play. But bringing into play all of those different elements of play that we engaged with as children, the different rhetorics of play, but now linking them to various concepts within learning. And computer games can be very effective in doing so. And we can design computer games around enhancing those aspects. Now, computer games were never necessarily meant to enhance educational outcomes, but they have embraced educational processes at a subconscious level. The challenges involved in computer games are built upon learning processes. People don't go into playing a computer game already having all of the skills and knowledge and um, capabilities to achieve in the computer game. They are developed as they play the game. They get better and better at doing various things. The game gets more and more challenging in response to that. Now, these are things that are fantastic in education, but are rarely seen outside of a computer game environment. Um, what's some other? Intuitive knowledge. The idea that repeated practice and experience builds up knowledge and capability, and it's to be valued. Um, the idea that everything is a subset of the real world and simplified, where everything can be simplified, and by simplifying the real world, we can contextualize activities within a game that help us understand and engage with really complex real world processes in a much easier way. A game like SimCity involved managing dozens of departments within the administrative processes of an entire city from waterworks and electricity systems and transport systems and healthcare systems and education systems far beyond what anyone would be able to conceive of being able to manage by themselves in the real world. Yet a computer game assumes that. It simplifies things to a point whereby players at very young ages can engage with managing the complexities of an entire system such as a city. That's a powerful aspect of computer games and computer simulations. Um, other aspects such as bottom-up skills principles. This is the idea that we start with basic skills and we build upon those to build more and more complex skills to allow us to do more and more within the game environment. The just-in-time principle where we learn just when it's necessary to be able to do something within the game. We don't learn all the skills of the game first and then be allowed to play the game. We learn just enough to get started. Then as we come to more and more complex challenges, the game offers us opportunities to learn about and practice and develop skills that allow us to then overcome those challenges. Again, something not often seen in our formal education system because we're often diverse or sorry, divorced from the real world environment and we do all of our learning and then we go out into the real world and we put it into practice. Okay, one more, let's pick an interesting one. Okay, the disperse principle. In this one, what we learn in a game can be shared with others. And some games have really picked up upon this. Minecraft is a great example. Minecraft came with no instructions whatsoever. There are now hundreds upon hundreds of pages of web, of web pages that explain all the different things that you can do and capabilities and objects and monsters and things within Minecraft. None of that existed when the game was created. It was all created by the players, sharing their ideas of how to do things in the game, um, the things they've discovered, and building up that community knowledge. 
and a number of games rely upon these processes. Some of them part of the game, some of them extraneous to the game, where players share hints about how to play the game and cheats and tips for overcoming various elements of the game. But it's a very different approach to what we see in many other educational processes. But it is a learning process. Everyone playing those games is learning. And one of the ways of learning is by accessing what others have shared about their own learnings all without any, having any ultimate authority figure with the official set of rules and procedures and so forth established for how to play the game. So have a look at those various principles. Have a look at some of um, Guy's video clips. Some are a little bit long, so you might skip through aspects of them. But just get a, a feeling for the complexity of learning as in they relate to gameplay and all of the different affordances that games can provide to support us in our learning journeys. So again, if you can think about a computer game that you've played and what some of the principles that Guy has described may resonate with you in terms of your own learning, learning how to play the game, but also what you may have learnt from playing the game. Um, I can recall in high school doing um, senior mathematics and we were doing a unit on vectors and I was finding it a little bit challenging but then I started playing a, a um, board game as it was then we didn't quite have computer games as much but it was a board game in which you had to move the spaceships around but you had to calculate the vectors and the thrust and everything else for how the spacecraft would move in relation to one another as they moved around this tabletop. And through engagement with that game, I had a much greater interest in learning about vectors, which is one of the big factors around games and their motivational factors. But it also provided me a way of engaging with the concept of vectors and the mathematics involved in vectors in a way that I wasn't necessarily having in a school formal learning process. So these are the things you need to can think about in terms of games, what they may have had a chance to teach you about the real world. Um, not so much what you learnt formally through the game, but the additional advantages that the game has provided in learning about the world. And of course, we can relate that to many other games, other types of games other than computer games. Um, learning about competitiveness and teamwork in sporting games is a common one. Learning about patience and thinking, forward thinking in games like chess um, and in social games, learning about how to establish and negotiate rules and conflict. Lots and lots of learning that can occur through games. Remembering games were once the most fundamental way that we went about all learning. So now we have a new phenomenon in gaming, um, which is called gamification. Now, this is taking all of these ideas that we've come across in gaming, just as we've been applying them to learning, others have been applying them to other purposes, um, including advertising and social change. And using these various concepts to gain competitive advantage in the advertising field and commercial field, but also using them to try to influence people towards different social agendas and social changes. And so all of these principles around gaming applied in other circumstances are what we call gamification. So it's not just using a game for these purposes, it's using the principles, which may be not involved in a natural playing of a game itself. So one example is, a more explicit example is, um, say the Monopoly game played by McDonald's, the restaurant. And when you purchase goods, you get a little token or little um, tag that gives you a, an opportunity to combine these tags, or in this case, letters, to play the Monopoly game. So the tags represent different um, properties around a fictional Monopoly board. And if you have the correct ones, then you can win prizes and, and so forth. So it was using the idea of playing a game and the idea of 
um, collecting these properties to achieve within the game as a way of encouraging people to purchase goods. Just one aspect of gamification, a very explicit one. Other aspects used in education commonly are league tables, um, whereby we rank students and they can move up and down upon a competitive league depending upon their performance, often in, in assessment tasks and things of that nature. Or giving rewards, such as um, gold stars for achievement. Um, again, a principle taken from gaming, where we award behavior through the gameplay processes, but here applied in an educational context. So again, think about gamification and think about an example from gamification that you have experienced and share that within the Teams environment. So that's it for this week and I look forward to seeing you in the tutorials.